Good evening and welcome. I'm uh, honored to introduce you Shir Hever. He's an economist at the Alternative Information Center. It's a Palestinian-Israeli organization that's uh, based in Jerusalem and Betzachu. Um, he will talk about the reality behind the European investment in the occupied Palestinian territories and who profit from this uh, investment. To react to react on his talk, we invite Ramzi Kursi, a board member of the Dutch organization Palestine Link. My name is Galitza Peta, and I'm a board member of Gate 48. It's a platform for critical Israelis living in the Netherlands. And <clears throat> this talk is a part of a series called In the Shadow of the Conflict, where we invite professionals that work on the grassroots level to share their knowledge with us. With this series, we aim to reveal the hidden but urgent issues that exist in the shadow of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. We at Gate 48 believe or feel that we have the obligation to try and to do what is in our power to change this reality. We believe that raising awareness here and influencing the Dutch public opinion will make a difference. Especially in this issue uh, that concerns the European financial involvement at large and the Dutch investment in the occupied Palestinian territories in particular. Uh, before I give the platform to Shir, I would like to thank uh, Kreya for hosting, uh, to different Jewish voice, Andrei Yotzchalaut, um, <coughs> Faculty for Israel, Palestine, Peace, Real World well Economist, and Stichting Democracy and Media. Platform is yours. Uh, so good evening everyone and thank you for coming. Thanks also to Gate48 for inviting me. Um, I just want to make a, a, a slight correction. I think the word investment might be a little misleading. I'll, I'll talk about uh, mainly about aid, international aid to the Palestinians uh, 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 because the issue of investment is uh, uh, an another uh, issue, uh, an interesting one. If you want, I can also talk about that in the question space. Um, and. Uh, I don't really know what is the level of, of your uh, knowledge and interest in the issue. I imagine that different people come with different uh, uh, levels of understanding and prior knowledge. So I'll try to keep my part as, uh, rather short to give us more time for a discussion. It's uh, nice to see some uh, familiar faces in the audience, but also a lot of new faces, so that's uh, always good. Um, and uh, uh, the way that I want to tackle this issue of aid to the Palestinians uh, uh, over the years is to go through a chronological uh, story. And uh, in this chronological story, uh, we see how Palestinians have uh, received aid from the international community in different forms and different, uh, for different purposes. Uh, and this aid uh, has been increased substantially four times. Uh, every time uh, that it was increased, it was increased for a reason. So I will talk about four periods of time where aid was increased, why it was, it was increased, what were the results, and what kind of aid we're talking about. Uh, and of course, the first time, uh, I'm, I'm starting right uh, into the heart of the matter, uh, the first time Palestinians uh, uh, become recipients of uh, international aid is in 1948 when uh, uh, the Nakba, the, uh, the Palestinian catastrophe by which uh, uh, the majority of the Palestinian population living in the area that has become Israel were deported from their homes, uh, from their villages uh, and cities, and uh, they became refugees. And the United Nations set up an agency to uh, uh, deal with the Palestinian uh, refugees and to give them some temporary support until the refugee issue will be resolved and they will be allowed to return to their homes. And this uh, agency called UNRWA, the United uh, Nations Relief uh, Network, uh, Relief Works uh, uh, Agency, uh, has established refugee camps uh, for the Palestinian population in uh, the West Bank, in the Gaza Strip. Uh, the Gaza Strip, by the way, uh, until today, is uh, um, the majority of the population in Gaza are refugees. And also in nearby countries, in Lebanon, in Egypt, in Syria, and in Jordan. And uh, these uh, uh, refugee camps uh, were, of course, supposed to be uh, a temporary uh, uh, assistance, like uh, uh, in many other cases where, uh, following war, uh, uh, there are refugees 
and the refugees receive some kind of assistance in order to um, uh, survive the interim period until they can uh, be resettled back in their homes. Um, but the Palestinian refugees still remain. And UNRWA continues to be the largest funded uh, aid project for Palestinians. So the aid to the refugees is the largest uh, uh, project. Um, and this is known as humanitarian aid. Because UNRWA is not able to develop the Palestinian economy. It's not within their mandate, and they don't have uh, the resources for that. Uh, what they can do is just make sure that people will have food and a place to live. Not very uh, uh, high level uh, uh, conditions, of course, uh, just basic subsistence levels. Um, and uh, uh, the fact that the situation remains for 64 uh, um, years almost uh, uh, unchanged is uh, the, that UNRWA uh, the, uh, is, is because there is still no political solution and still the rights of the refugees are not recognized. Uh, and I will get back to this point. Now, the next date that I want to mention is 1967. I'm jumping 19 years. We'll start to go into more detail the more we get closer to the present time, of course. Um, and in 1967, aid to the Palestinians was not increased. Because the international community's response to the Israeli occupation of the Palestinian territories, I'm not talking about the Israeli occupation of uh, other territories, not, the, not just the Palestinian ter territories were involved, uh, but also uh, Israel occupied the Syrian Golan Heights and the Egyptian uh, Sinai Peninsula. But just talking about Palestinian territories, uh, Palestinians, uh, the, the international community didn't recognize the occupation and does not recognize it until today officially, even though de facto in many ways the international community, um, especially the Dutch government, do uh, uh, accept the Israeli occupation and support it in, in various ways. Uh, but in 1967, while not uh, uh, recognizing the occupation, uh, uh, then there is no point and no reason to give aid to the Palestinians. In fact, according to international humanitarian law, the occupying power is obligated to make uh, sure that the uh, population, the occupied population, uh, uh, meets all of its needs. Uh, so things like education, jobs, transportation, health, this is the responsibility of the occupier. <coughs> if the international community would give uh, a Palestinians a hospital, for example, they would actually be giving a gift to Israel. This is very clear. It's Israel's responsibility to make sure Palestinians have sufficient uh, uh, access to health. So the international community did not increase its aid. But at the same time, just keeping the old projects of UNRWA created uh, absurd situations. I'll just give one example, the refugee camp in uh, East Jerusalem. Because uh, uh, the, the Shuafat refugee camp uh, has been annexed by Israel because Israel decided that all of East Jerusalem will now permanently be part of Israel and uh, the Israeli law will apply to this territory even though Palestinians born in this area do not become Israeli citizens but they're still living in what Israel considers to be part of Israel. Nevertheless, of course, this annexation is illegal and not recognized by the international community and UNRWA maintains the refugee camp in the Shuaf in, uh, called Shuafat. Uh, so they continue to maintain it. But now, according to Israel, this is a neighborhood in Jerusalem. And this creates a situation in which the United Nations, using funds, uh, um, also your money, uh, you should know that uh, uh, the largest donation of, of uh, the Dutch government to the aid to Palestinians goes to UNRWA, uh, are giving support to the Palestinian population in, in Shuafat in the form of uh, municipal services, uh, sewage services, water, cleaning, and so on. This is the responsibility of Israel, but somehow uh, the, Israeli, the Jerusalem municipality, the Israeli Jerusalem municipality, gets a discount because UNRWA is paying part of the bill. Um, but of course, things started to change in 1994. And the beginning of the Oslo process uh, su suddenly created a, a shift in the political situation because <coughs> we were told. And uh, there is going to be peace. There are, there are negotiations, and eventually these negotiations are intended to lead to an independent Palestinian state. And an independent Palestinian state uh, is, does qualify for aid. There's no reason not, why not to uh, support the Palestinian state. At that moment, the European uh, uh, Union made a strategic, uh, a strategic decision to support the two-state solution by giving aid to the Palestinians. Now this decision, I, I, it's important to stress, it's a strategic decision. It's not a humanitarian decision. 
the United Nations, uh, the, 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 sorry, the, the European Union is not particularly um, interested in the well-being of Palestinians. This is not the main reason. The reason is that this is an interest, an economic interest mainly, of Europe to keep the Middle East uh, calm, to prevent wars that of course affect a lot of things like the price of oil and the demand for consumer products that are produced in Europe and so on. Um, so, but, but at the same time, Europe uh, is paralyzed in a way because uh, they are obligated to use a system, or they, they obligate themselves to use a system, of carrots and no sticks. You know, the old uh, saying of the carrot and the stick. Aid is a carrot. They can give money in the hope that this money will encourage uh, Palestinian economic development and therefore make the two-state solution more likely. But they cannot put any sanctions on Israel for political reasons. Part of the reason for that is that uh, uh, the, uh, European Commission, uh, the European Council has to take decisions by consensus and at least one country, usually that country's name is Germany, would veto the, uh, any decision in the European Council uh, uh, against Israel. Uh, but actually Germany has kind of changed its opinions and now one of the most, uh, uh, one of the countries that protects Israeli interests in the European Council more than any other is uh, uh, the Netherlands. Not the only one, also uh, Poland, but uh, the Netherlands is, is certainly in the top three. Um, so this creates a situation where money can be sent, more and more money can be spent on the Palestinians, but uh, no sanctions can be put on Israel. And this created a very interesting reality. Of course, donors wanted to put most of the effort on development aid. Development aid is intended to, to create economic opportunities, uh, to create jobs, to uh, uh, improve the infrastructure, because uh, eventually Palestinians uh, should have a, a functioning economy. Um, and uh, uh, Without a functioning economy, there can be no uh, uh, true independence. And if there is no independence, if the Palestinians continue to be completely dependent on the Israeli economy, then can we say that the occupation has really ended? So development aid is the highest priority. Between the year 1994 and 2000, seven billion dollars were invested uh, uh, in development aid. Now development aid is separate from humanitarian aid, like UNRWA, and other f projects of humanitarian aid, the Red Cross, the World Food Program, there are a lot of humanitarian aid projects, but most of the money in, in those seven years was in development. And the standard of living of Palestinians over that time has declined. Unemployment increased, poverty increased, uh, and uh, uh, how, how can that be with so much investment, so much aid? Still the, uh, the situation of, of Palestinians become, becomes worse. Um, now, uh, um, one of the, uh, uh, the, the Israeli uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs explained uh, uh, the, this situation by saying that uh, this is because of the corruption in the Palestinian Authority. Uh, but I think it's very important to mention the, the simple fact. These seven billion dollars that I'm discussing never passed through the Palestinian Authority. The Palestinian Authority was never allowed to touch them. They were all managed by international organizations like the World Bank. Uh, and uh, international NGOs that uh, uh, control the money very closely and demanded that each uh, expenditure will be made with the receipt. So uh, uh, there was a very strict control, no corruption on that part. Uh, uh, the Palestinian Authority's own budget is where uh, 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 some, some corruption uh, could have taken place and, and some did take place. Uh, I'm not going to go into that uh, uh, unless someone will ask me a question because it's a, a, a much smaller amount of money. Uh, and, uh, uh, but I will get back to the budget of the Palestinian Authority soon. But the issue of, of the development aid uh, and the failure of the development aid needs another explanation. Why did it fail? Um, now, the reason for that, we have to look back to 1967. When Israel took over the Palestinian territories, there was a decision by the chief commanders of the Israeli army and the uh, chief politicians. And this decision was never written down on a piece of paper. They all agreed uh, uh, to follow this policy, and many years later, some of the people who were uh, uh, part of this decision-making process admitted that the decision was taken not to allow Palestinians to develop their economy in any way that would compete with the Israeli economy. So Palestinians were allowed uh, to build houses for themselves, they were allowed to uh, attain education and, and uh, uh, go and work in the Gulf states, uh, for example, but they were not allowed to uh, develop industrial, uh, their industrial sector, their financial sector, or even parts of the commercial sector that would be able to sell to Israel. 
And because of that, uh, their economy was basically frozen by the Israeli authorities. Like I said, this was not written down, but in practice, this has happened again and again. And, it was, uh, in, uh, uh, and this policy was never changed. So during the 90s, during the Oslo process, when so much money was coming from the international community, there was a very complicated mechanism. The raw materials for the aid projects were stopped at the Israeli seaports and held at the customs for months. So a lot of the budget went just to pay for the uh, uh, storage fees at the customs. When they were finally released from customs, they had to be loaded on Israeli uh, uh, trucks, and then the Israeli trucks were stopped at the checkpoint, the internal checkpoints inside Gaza or inside the West Bank, uh, where they had to wait for weeks. And the uh, donors, the international donors, had to pay not only for the storage fees, but they also had to pay the salary of the driver and the cost of the truck of the Israeli company. Uh, and uh, Palestinian workers who were hired to build these projects were stopped at the checkpoint as well. So they got into the car, went to work, the car was stopped at the checkpoint for half a day, half a day of work is lost, sometimes a whole day of work is lost. Um, and in some cases, such as for example the uh, Dutch funded seaport in Gaza, I assume most of you know what I'm talking about, so if not uh, I will uh, have to, to uh, explain that story. Uh, uh, Israeli airplanes bombed the actual project, the Dutch government until today, uh, 12 years later, 11 years later, never uh, asked for its money back from Israel after this uh, port was demolished. Um, so these are projects that were funded by the international community, the money was wasted. And uh, um, at that point, I, I want to go to the next uh, uh, stage in this chronological story, the year 2000 and the beginning of the Second Intifada. From the point of view of the Palestinians, uh, the Second Intifada came after uh, a lot of frustration from the aid uh, projects and from the peace process because it actually led to no improvement in their lives. Uh, uh, quite the opposite. Because the aid was so high, the Israeli government adopted a, a new policy, a policy they call separation. And the policy of separation means that, well, now Israel can continue to expand the, colo the colonies in the West Bank. Uh, and at the time also the colonies in Gaza. And Israel can continue to take control of the land and to exploit the Palestinian economy, but Israel is no longer obligated to consider the well-being of Palestinian uh, uh, civilians in the occupied territory because someone else is paying that bill. So, uh, um, in fact, uh, uh, this, is a, this is a quote that I heard from um, um, Brigadier General Yair Golan, who was the commander of the Israeli army uh, uh, in the West Bank, and he said, well, it's no longer part of our decision-making process in the army, what is the effect of our actions on the Palestinian population? Because now someone else is in charge of their well-being. Uh, we can do whatever we want, basically, uh, only consider the issue of security for Israelis, uh, and the Palestinians uh, uh, will, will uh, uh, what have, whatever happens to them is the responsibility of, of the Palestinian Authority, of the international community. Um, so that actually allowed Israel to impose, during the Second Intifada, uh, and a, a mass closure and a mass attack on the Palestinian economy. Now, you'll notice I'm not really talking about the attack on, on people, which I think is more important, all the people who were killed and injured by, by the Israeli army. But uh, because this is an economic topic, I'll, uh, forgive me for, for focusing on the economic side of things, uh, and I'll talk more about uh, the uh, hundreds of thousands of olive trees, fruit-bearing olive trees that were uh, uprooted by the Israeli army, and uh, the fact that Palestinians were no longer able to go to work uh, uh, because uh, of the internal curfew and closure uh, policies, and of course, they were not able to work uh, in Israel because of the uh, blanket uh, closure on the ability of Palestinian workers to work inside Israel. Um, I, I just remember that I skipped a point, uh, uh, because in 1994, uh, uh, the beginning of the Oslo process, there was also an economic side to these negotiations. It's called the Paris Protocols. The Paris Pro I don't want to go too much into the uh, intricacies of, of the treaty itself and what it means, but it's important to mention in this context that Israel was obligated to allow Palestinian workers uh, to enter Israel freely to seek employment in exchange for uh, the Palestinians agreeing that uh, Israel will control all the customs uh, uh, of uh, uh, um, 
products that are being imported either to Israel or to the Palestinian uh, 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 territory. So Israel con con uh, maintains complete control of the borders. In exchange, Palestinians may still be allowed to work inside Israel, but Israel broke both sides of this, <coughs> of this agreement. Um, so in the year 2000, there is a second intifada, Palestinians, uh, Palestinian uprising against the Israeli occupation, met with massive Israeli attacks on the Palestinian economy, and suddenly people are not able to go to work, not even able to do shopping, uh, and uh, there is a humanitarian crisis. The international community responds to the second intifada by doubling the amount of aid. So I said these are the times when aid was increased. It was increased in uh, 48, increased in 94, and now increased in 2000 again. Aid was doubled, and the dependency ratio of Palestinians on aid has uh, also reached for the first time in the second intifada more than 50%. So more than 50% of the income, uh, the GNI, gross national income of the Palestinian uh, economy, uh, was uh, dependent on international aid. Because all of the other parts of the economy were paralyzed. Or not all of them, but most of them were paralyzed by the Israeli occupation. But aid was not just doubled, it was also shifted. It was, it was changed. During the 90s, most of the aid was development aid, like I said before, investment in projects, like the Dutch investment in the seaport. But after the Second Intifada, aid was reverted back to humanitarian aid. Humanitarian aid, meaning food, medicine, shelter, trying to help people cope with the disaster uh, that they were facing. But, of course, humanitarian aid, even though we can all understand why it was very needed at that moment and people were, were at, at an immediate risk to their lives, we, can, we should also understand the, the, the big political problem. Because once again, it's Israel's responsibility and humanitarian aid does not contribute to the future Palestinian economy or the future Palestinian independence. It's just uh, intended to prevent the situation from deteriorating further. And when donors say, well, now is not the time to build a new road, now we'll just make sure that uh, Palestinians have something to eat tomorrow, they're actually playing exactly into the, eyes, uh, into the hands of Israel. This is exactly what Israel wants. And Israel benefits from it, and I'll get back to the point of how Israel benefits from it uh, in a minute. The second intifada passed, aid started to drop again. Aid uh, uh, declined. And the Palestinian economy uh, recovered partially from the second intifada, uh, and uh, still not reaching the, the level of, uh, of standard of living that they had in 1994. So actually, overall growth was negative uh, on a per capita level. But uh, Palestinians um, ha tried very much to, to increase uh, their, uh, to, to bring back the uh, international community to the track of development aid rather than humanitarian aid. Um, because, of course, Palestinians are not interested to live off charity. They're interested in working and, and uh, uh, sustaining themselves in dignity. And the main thing that Palestinians, uh, uh, Palestinian economists, Palestinian uh, activists are saying is that uh, uh, aid is uh, maybe a short-term assistance, but it cannot replace the issue of, of the Palestinian rights. Uh, and no development aid can really work within a context of occupation. No development aid can hope to uh, create growth while at the same time Israel can, can control all of the movement, all of the exports and imports, and so on. Nevertheless, uh, there is another increase of aid. And the last increase we, we're seeing, especially uh, since the year 2008. Or the end of 2007, also, uh, um, uh, when, when a big conference in Paris was uh, organized uh, in order to generate the donations uh, for the Palestinians. But the conference was in December, so we're talking about aid coming in starting from 2008. And this aid uh, uh, takes two forms, because now Israel successfully uh, cut the West Bank from the Gaza Strip, not just physically, but also politically. Uh, and uh, the West Bank and the Gaza Strip are now getting different kinds of aid. The Gaza Strip has become the most aid-dependent area in the world, because at the moment uh, exports are almost completely forbidden from Gaza. There are a few tiny exceptions, including, for example, some flowers that are allowed to be exported into uh, the Netherlands. Uh, but, uh, but this is uh, a very small uh, a part of the, of the Gaza economy. 
uh, and uh, uh, it, most of the people in Gaza, the only reason that they are sustained is because food is brought to them. And that's why uh, activists often say Gaza is the biggest prison in the world because in a way people are not allowed to leave. Um, uh, uh, most people are not allowed to enter. Uh, there are some, some uh, uh, exceptions to that. Uh, and uh, uh, they eat food that is brought to them from the outside because they cannot sustain themselves uh, under these conditions. Uh, there is a strict control of what they're allowed to import uh, and uh, uh, very strict controls of, uh, over what they're allowed to do. But the aid increase is not just in Gaza, it's more pronounced in the West Bank, but it's not development aid and it's not humanitarian aid. It's budget support for the Palestinian Authority. Um, budget support, support for the Palestinian Authority has become a very uh, a large part of the aid specifically uh, uh, after the elections of 2006, uh, not immediately after, uh, because as you know, uh, the international community put a lot of pressure on the Palestinians to have free democratic elections. These elections did take place in 2006, uh, in January, the Hamas party won the elections. Then the international community changed their minds and said, well, actually, we don't accept the party that was elected, and we're going to boycott it. And the Hamas party was boycotted, and the Palestinian Authority was almost collapsed because they lost their sources of funding. And um, uh, eventually, uh, a new government was appointed to the Palestinians. It was not an elected government, headed by uh, Prime Minister Salam Fayyad, who is still the Prime Minister. He's a former worker of the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund. Um, and uh, he, uh, his political party is, is very small. And he uh, uh, is running the West Bank. Hamas took over the Gaza Strip. And then uh, uh, Fayyad, after becoming prime minister, started to get more and more money from the international community, because he was, especially from Europe and the United States, because he was seen as promoting uh, um, the interests of uh, uh, the, the international community, the, the West. Um, and and what I, I am very uncomfortable saying this, because I'm Israeli. But I think, uh, uh, but, but I, you should know that a lot, what a lot of Palestinians are saying is actually promoting the interests of Israel. Uh, and um, he's, uh, uh, and the, this money coming as budget support for the Palestinian Authority was supposed to help create a um, better government for the Palestinians with the assumption that somehow if the Palestinians would have a well-functioning Police for, a well-functioning police force, well-functioning public services, well-functioning uh, and, and efficient uh, uh, ministries, then uh, the occupation will end. I have to admit that I never quite understood how. <laughs> and, uh, the, um, and this is the second biggest uh, uh, donation of the Dutch government to the Palestinians. So I said number one is UNRWA, and number two is budget support for the Palestinian Authority. But actually, after the Palestinian Authority, um, after a couple of years, uh, after 2000, uh, uh, Fayyad became Prime Minister in 2007, after a few years, there, there's increasing demand in the Palestinian public asking the Palestinian Authority, in what way are you trying to end occupation? The peace process, as we all know, is leading nowhere. And at that moment, uh, the Palestinian Authority uh, uh, decided to appeal to the United Nations to uh, um, ask for a state uh, uh, of, of statehood, to, to be recognized as a state by the United Nations, something that has so far been blocked by the United States. But um, after they made their appeal to the United Nations, despite repeated warnings by Israel and by the United States, don't, uh, don't try to do that, um, the Palestinian Authority also started to lose its budget support. So I said there was a big increase in 2008. This, this increase is already a thing of the past. Now the Palestinian Authority is in a status of near bankruptcy because they've lost their budget support from the international community, because Israel is freezing money that is supposed to go to the Palestinian Authority through the Israeli custom system, because like I said, Israel controls all the customs, and as a result, the Palestinian Authority is paralyzed as well. Um, I want to make two last points. Um, one is that uh, uh, how Israel profits from the aid. Now, first of all, uh, um, Palestinians are not the only ones who receive aid. Uh, as you know, uh, uh, there are other countries in the world that receive aid. And there is a myth 
that has been uh, promoted by some pro-Israeli writers uh, that Palestinians receive the highest per capita aid in the world. And that's not true. Uh, but they are amongst the highest. They are, they are about number 11 in terms of per capita. Only 10 countries in the world receive more aid per capita than Palestinians if we look at the long-term uh, aid uh, uh, disbursement between 1994 and 2006. Uh, but among these 11 countries that receive more, uh, sorry, the 10 countries that receive more than the Palestinians, we find Israel. Israel receives per capita aid uh, at number five in the world. Uh, and it should be noted that the only four countries that receive more per capita aid than Israel are very, very small countries like Paleo and uh, uh, French Polynesia, uh, countries with, with a smaller population than Israel. So uh, Israel actually receives a lot of aid. Most of the aid that Israel receives is not humanitarian aid, not development aid, not budget support, but military aid. Uh, so here's an, a fourth kind of aid for you. And uh, of course, most of that aid comes from the United States. Um, Palestinians also receive some military aid from the United States. Uh, this military aid, very, very small, uh, and, and of course this military aid uh, is more police aid. It's intended to control the Palestinian population itself. As we've seen, for example, with the Dayton uh, Brigade that was trained by General Dayton from the United States in Jordan and then deployed in the Palestinian territories with orders to prevent, uh, for example, uh, uh, Hamas political activists from operating freely in the West Bank. But uh, uh, when they were deployed in Hebron, just one uh, month after their deployment, uh, uh, Israeli colonists um, uh, started a pogrom against Palestinians in that city and attacked Palestinians uh, uh, violently, and the Dayton Brigade stood by and didn't do anything. Um, but, so obviously Israel profits from the aid that it, oh, that it receives from the United States. Partially, this aid is because Israel promotes U.S. policies in the Middle East, and the United States is not particularly interested in, in seeing the Middle East uh, 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 move into a, a time of peace. Um, but there's also uh, uh, direct ways by which Israel profits from the aid. Because uh, according to the Paris Protocols, it's actually usually cheaper for the uh, donors to buy the food, the medicine, uh, or other products that they want to uh, uh, distribute to the Palestinians from Israeli companies. And so they buy much of, of these products from Israeli companies. And then they're obligated anyway to use Israeli companies to transport these products because they're not allowed to use Palestinian trucks, of course. So again, Israeli transport uh, uh, sector, including the airport and the seaports, profit from the aid. But all the aid has to be done in Israeli currency. Palestinians don't have their own currency. And all the donors have to change their currency, whether it's euros, dollars, or whatever, into Israeli currency in order to pay the salaries to their local staff, buy the products, uh, and, and even pay taxes to the Israeli government. So they change their foreign currency at the Israeli Central Bank. The foreign currency stays at the uh, vaults of the Israeli Central Bank, which, by the way, have the highest uh, amount of foreign currency in Israel's history now because all this money is coming in, not just because of the occupation, but, but the occupation is a big reason for that. And then the money is spent in Israeli shekels. Uh, in uh, economic jargon, uh, we call this kind of situation export. Israel is exporting the occupation, and the international community is buying it. It's willing to pay for it. Uh, so it's not just about the uh, issue of Israel uh, 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 footing the bill to the international community, but also direct way that Israel profits. I think, nevertheless, the most important issue is responsibility. <coughs> the responsibility, according to international law, is very clearly Israel's responsibility to the occupied uh, uh, population. But there is also an international aspect to this responsibility. The international community has allowed Israel to remain unaffected uh, uh, and, and non-sanctioned despite of the uh, many violations of, of international law. In fact, even as Israel continues to violate international law and, and fails to meet its obligations uh, towards the occupied popu a, a, a population, uh, the trade benefits that Israel receives from Europe, for example, continue to improve. And this improvement in the trade benefits um, are including, for example, joint uh, military research, uh, makes Europe directly involved in the occupation. 
And uh, in, in some ways, uh, the occupation is, is exported to Europe not just in the sense that Europe is paying for it, but also in the sense that part of the occupation finds its way into Europe in the form of Israeli technology. Uh, as you know, uh, uh, the Israeli occupation forces have turned the Palestinian population into a, a kind of laboratory, experimenting in new technology to uh, uh, suppress demonstrations and to control po uh, the population with biometric measures, surveillance cameras, uh, and uh, also various uh, uh, so-called non-lethal or less lethal weaponry used against uh, uh, demonstrators. And these technologies are then bought by European armies, by the European uh, uh, police uh, forces, uh, further intensifying the responsibility of the international community to the Palestinians. Now, I know that uh, uh, in the Netherlands there are those who say that maybe uh, um, international aid, if it's not effective, it should just be stopped. Uh, and and uh, uh, why should uh, the Netherlands pay for the problems of others? Uh, but uh, we have to be aware of the fact that when uh, the aid is given to, uh, um, in, in a framework that is politically irresponsible and ignores the effects of the occupation on the Palestinian population and, and somehow uh, donors think that they, they can build a little project and get all the permits from the Israeli government to do it and do everything according to how Israel tells them, uh, this is... Uh, 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 that, that this is okay, but no, it's, it, 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 it's actually the opposite. In many ways, such projects are, are causing political damage and making the occupation more entrenched and more permanent, and that creates more responsibility for the international community and for Europe uh, to uh, um, uh, send another kind of aid, one which uh, actually meets the needs of the local population and helps them directly to overcome the occupation. So uh, thank you very much. I'll stop here and we'll have more time for questions later.